James, it's great to have you on. Um, this is this is actually the first time we can say we've got a name for for what this is. Our, our I suppose podcast called Live Like an Athlete, and we're delighted to have you on today. But if you would like to give us a bit of a background into who James Moran is, what you do, and why you do what you do, yeah, yeah, thanks for the invite. So, um, I'm based in a town called Oldham, which is on the outskirts of Manchester. And I work as a performance nutritionist, um, mostly the past few years in endurance sports and and cycling. Um, recently come back from from doing the Tour de France with the team that I'm working with at the moment. Um, before moving into professional cycling, I worked in the Eng- English Institute of Sport for a few years um, in a variety of different sports, para swimming, cycling, equestrianism, which was, yeah, really really strange all, all of the horse people that I, I knew nothing about but I learned a lot from working in a different different culture with that and I think I probably left some things that that Im- helped improve the sport a little bit um and then rewinding a long way back um I was a clinical dietitian for for 10 years so I worked in the health service in in the UK and my area of speciality in that became diabetes and type 1 diabetes and working with with sports people with type 1 diabetes um and then i had quite a long journey to working as a, a sports nutritionist that was always my aim when i set out um in the early 2000s um but at that time there wasn't really a career path to being a sports nutritionist so i did a degree in sport and exercise science um and most of my colleagues became PE teachers at that time, but I knew I wanted to do something in nutrition, but there wasn't really a a way of doing it. So I went down the clinical route. I was with the view to moving back to being a sports nutritionist at some point. And then after about 10 years, I took a bit of a gamble and decided to do a, a master's in sports nutrition at, at Liverpool, John Moores. So I, I cashed, cashed everything in, lived off my wife's salary for a year and decided, you know, I wanted to be a sports nutritionist. So I was going to go all in for it. And I thought if if it didn't work out, I could always go back to the health service with with my tail between my legs. But I, I very much went all in, and that was maybe seven seven years ago. And since then, I've managed to build enough work to to work now as a full time performance nutritionist in in professional sport. James, sorry, Gemma, I I want to touch on something really important here, uh, and that is, how did you know this? this was what you wanted to do you know there's a lot of people think they want to be performance nutritionists how did you know and what were the early phases of that transition like how did it feel from once you qualified now you're a performance nutritionist and actually going out and being a performance nutritionist and the business side of it as well yeah good question i'm i always knew i wanted to work as like a support personnel in sports so way back being like 17 18 I originally thought I wanted to be a, a physiotherapist I knew I wanted to you know be around athletes I knew I was never going to be gifted enough to be an athlete um, but at that time and a friend of mine's brother was a physio working with a football team and that that seemed really really appealing but then around the time we do A levels in the UK I actually picked the wrong combination of A levels that meant I couldn't couldn't do physiotherapy I also looked at sports journalism as an as another avenue and then sports science degrees in the early 2000s were were becoming a thing and I kind of thought well that that ticks a lot of those boxes of of what I'm interested in um so yeah it was always around wanting to 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 be involved in professional sport in some some aspect but more of the the health support side of things I knew yeah like I said knew very early on I wasn't wasn't ever going to be gifted enough to um to to be an athlete, but I probably knew that I had had the work ethic and probably the mindset to to work in that space. Um, and then it was in in our sports science degree. Um, there was a dietitian who who still works, and I still speak to Nigel Mitchell, who at that time was working in the British Olympic system. They'd started to get funding um, and developing a nutrition role, and he he was doing lectures about nutrition in general but talking about the actual day-to-day work and I was like wow that's that's the job I want how how do, how do I do that and there wasn't like a a defined way of well you do this you do that and then you get get the job at the end of it and he he was also a clinical dietitian and it was him who kind of said well you should probably 
maybe look to, to develop your skills in the clinical space and then see if you can pick up some sport work as the profession evolves. So that's the kind of way it went. But then 10 years later on, <laughs> this th that still hadn't happened. And I was still very much at this crossroads where, I, you know, I had a good, well-paid job in the health service, which I enjoyed, but I knew it wasn't, I wasn't going to keep progressing. I knew I'd kind of achieved everything that I wanted to and developed as much as as I was going to in that role, which is fine. But I knew that I want I wanted more, and I wasn't happy to 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 stagnate in that role that I was doing. So that's what really gave me the jolt to to go for it to be to working in sport sports nutrition and and to to go all into to uh, specialize in that area. Um, the the big challenges for me were I I had this breadth of ten years of clinical experience dealing with pregnant women in a clinic who might have substance issues to dealing with a lawyer who might have type one diabetes to dealing with a frail elderly lady who has dementia, who was, wasn't eating. So I had all of these different experiences of consultations and, and unique situations, a lot of knowledge of clinical nutrition an understanding of sport, but I kind of had this gap there where I didn't have the, the kind of last, layers of of knowledge and and experience of working working with athletes so that was that was quite hard because i was experienced in a lot of ways but i wasn't experienced of working in sport so that was a bit of a challenge early on um and then you said about the yeah the, the business the business side about being a sports nutrition that's something i'm i'm terrible at um yeah so <laughs> Every every day it's something that I struggle with 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 the financial side, with the admin side. I'm I don't really yeah, all of all of that stuff, the social media side, it's not something that, that kind of come comes naturally to me. But I, I know now as a as a sports nutritionist, that's that's something that's more and more important and probably should be taught a little bit in um some of the education programs. I think where it's really solidified your decision that this is exactly what I want to do. Yeah, I mean it it was really tough that period. Like when I reflect back, like my wife was expecting our first child. Um, you know, there wasn't a guarantee that I was going to get a job from doing this master's. But I, when I started the master's at Liverpool, John Moores, there was me and another guy who were, we were in our 30s. And we both knew that we would be working in professional sport by the end of that master's. There was no, there was no, uh, like, you know, to, not to be corny, but failure wasn't an option because there was so much at stake. And it was quite frustrating. There was, there was people on my course who were, 21 they just finished an undergrad they were just doing a master's for something to do or the mum and dad had funded it there was academically way more gifted people than me on that master's and I just got really frustrated I was like you know I knew that I would do everything I could to to get everything I could from the master's I didn't really care about what grades I got as long as I, I knew that I was learning everything I could I was any free tutorial on Excel or anything that the university offered, I was there. Whereas other other people were like, well, why are you doing that? You know, James Morton and Graham Close were two of our lecturers. I'd be constantly knocking on their door saying, can you explain the methods of this? I, I don't understand it. You know, I, I thought I'm investing a lot of money here. I'm going to get everything out, out of it that I can. And then... With the, we had we were lucky to have placements and things, um, internships, and there was one with the English Institute of Sport. And again, I was like, I'm I'm gonna get that. I'm gonna do everything I can to get that role. And that was kind of what helped me get my foot foot in the door. Um, so I think that's probably what helped helped me to get to where I am now. I knew that I wasn't gonna. I didn't want to go back to the health service. I knew that my wife was expecting a baby, and you know, I was living off off her salary for the year. So I needed to make it work. I just want to say people need to hear this. People need to hear this type of story. And I, when you come through what you just described, that you absolutely know this is what I want to do and failure is not an option. Like, because it's not just about achieving your master's. It's not just about getting that job. It's It's always a challenge. And there's always something in front of you that you are going to have to overcome to build and be successful within this business and within this industry. And it's haphazard. And like you said, there isn't this clear path. Um, so it's really, really important, I feel, for people who want to pursue this type of career to understand that. Yeah, definitely. And I'd say it's probably only the last four years that I've now managed to have like 
big substantive roles where I'm, I consider myself like full-time employed, whereas up to that point, I was still doing bits of consultations for free, um, you know, a day here, a day there, random semi-professional athletes. To, so it was, it was still very, very haphazard in those times. I was like, you know, I've got enough work within professional sport and I'm picking up all these random things that I'm probably not that interested in, but I knew it was like a, a means to an end. And I get people contacting me now on social media, like, how did you get a job in professional cycling? Um, any tips? Can I come and shadow you? And, or, you know, and I'll always speak to people to help people out, but it's almost that they're expecting there's this like magic formula. Well, I finished uni and then got this job and now, you know, now, now I'm laughing and I do the Tour de France and there's so many like steps, but a lot of each one of those steps has definitely made me a better practitioner. Like I did some work with some local professional boxers for free. Uh, it was helping them out, but the, the things I learned from working with those guys around weight making and they were, they were naive. They'd never worked with a nutritionist. I'd never worked with a boxer. So we were kind of both getting something from it, but the things I learned and picked up there at, is stuff I still use today. And I think sometimes like free work, it can be like viewed as a bit of a dirty thing or people straight away say, oh, well, I can't do that because I have these other responsibilities or finances, which I get. But I always think of it, well, you could view it differently and almost see it as free CPD rather than seeing it as like unpaid work. Um, and James, whenever you're obviously done finished your master's, you're probably ready to go into the world of work. So I, I know you said you were working with the boxers, I suppose you're in with the cyclists now. Was that who you wanted to be with? Yeah, I, I originally knew quite early on that I wanted to work in in cycling. Um, so I've grown up playing playing football and rugby. I'm from like a team sport background. I'm not like, um, yeah, I'm not a, a, a cyclist as such, but I just, the demands of the sport, and I've always been a fan of, of cycling and watching the Tour de France and seeing how important nutrition is to that and how how it's a key determinant of of performance was something that that appealed to me a little bit like when doing work with boxes. It's high risk, high reward. If you get it, if you get it right, it can really make a difference to performance. If you get it wrong and that that rider under fuels and, and loses the race, then then you're in the firing line. And I I really like that that challenge, that high pressure. And I remember being sat in an antenatal clinic and an advert popped up for a job at British Cycling. It was before the Rio Rio Games. And this was around the time I was looking at getting out and doing the Masters. And this job popped up and I was like, oh, that's a cool job. That's the kind of job I want to be doing, working with British Cycling, supporting the riders for Rio. And it, you read the job spec and I thought, well, yeah, I don't have any of that, but I'm going to apply anyway. Applied, didn't hear anything. And... um. I know now Lauren Delaney and Catherine Brown, Kath Brown got, got that role. And I was like, if that's the job I kind of want, then I really need to do the masters and make sure I have all these, this criteria. So if it comes up in the future, that's, that's what I'll do. So then when the placements were announced on the masters, there was one at British cycling in England, English Institute of sports. So I was like, right, I'm going to, I'm going to go all in for that. That's, that's what I want to do. So we had an interview process and everything and was lucky enough to manage to get, get that role working under Lauren and and Kath. Um, and then while I was like in the EIS, because I was already qualified as a clinical dietitian, it meant that I was like treated a little bit differently. So little projects and things that probably wouldn't be given to master's students, I was kind of allowed a little bit more, yeah, autonomy and, and work on. And then while we were on the master's, a, a maternity job came up at um, British Para Swimming. So I knew nothing about swimming. Um, I knew nothing about para sport, but again, I thought, well, it's a opportunity working with elite athletes. It's temporary, so it's a you know, I think it was three days a week as a maternity cover. It'll get my foot in the door with the English Institute of Sport. I'll learn about an, a new sport, and it's a chance to develop my skills. So I managed to get that role before the masters had finished. I think because I was already a clinical dietitian, I was allowed to. Whereas I think I would have probably had to wait for the masters and. SCNR and all that stuff. So that was the first first role that I did, and that that was that was good. I learned a lot about para sport. I learned a lot how it's different to um, like able bodied sport in some respects. Uh, but I kind of went in thinking it was exactly the same, and I learned a lot about you know some of the challenges around social settings and um, the psychology of, of 
of para athletes and and all of the stuff that they have to deal with outside of being an athlete so that was that was quite um yeah a big a steep learning curve um but i did get a lot from it um that, i think i was there for maybe nine months that was like my first role but because then i was in the eis and everybody knew i was doing a part-time role and i'd made a good impression then little projects would would crop up here and there like the stuff with equestrian and i always say when i present this stuff never look a gift horse in the mouth and i present like a picture of like one of these equestrian horses because if someone said to me do you want to do you want to work in equestrianism i'd first say what is it and they'd say oh you know the people on the horses do you know doing gymnastics and stuff like that and i was like oh pro- probably not but at that time i thought yeah i'll, I'll go for it and I was doing one-to-one uh sessions and group sessions with people who didn't think of themselves as athletes their whole concern was with the horse and they would a lot of them would smoke they would live off red bull all day they'd be working from six in the morning looking after the horse they'd do some training so trying to shift that mindset of making them yeah think more like an athlete and that was that was um yeah that was that was good like when i reflect back i learned a lot from from that from that time um it was just funny the first people would always say oh do you ride and i'd be like yeah i ride a bike and they're like oh no do you have horses i'm like no no like people don't have horses where where i come from uh, maybe some of the farmers so it was good again to work in different cultures and and learn about different people because something i feel really passionate about it's we're delivering nutrition but it's all working with people you know it's it's people are complex and learning about people's culture and background and beliefs and relationships with food and the families what what shapes it all so yeah that they were my my first roles in the eis as a bit of a long story there that's really interesting and whenever you were talking about like the working with the Paris sport, what was kind of the major differences that you would see between working with them? Versus- yeah. I mean, with, with Paris sport, there's no, there is textbooks, but you know, every able-bodied athlete is unique and individual, but in Paris sport, that's magnified, you know, tenfold. So you might have people with the same condition, for example, and, you know, I've only done this role in para sports, so I'm probably not the best person to speak about it, but it's so individual and you, you can't really compare anything. So, you know, the energy demands are you, you kind of guessing and there's no gold standards and references and things like that, but you, you figure all that out. I always think that's, that's the easy part of the job or the easier part of the job. The hard part is, is dealing with this individual and their complex ecosystem, you know, a lot of the the power athletes would burst onto the scene at quite quite a young age, 13, 14. They would have relationships with their parents and coaches that were still very much part of it now, even though they were 18, 19. Um the the depth of, of athletes wasn't the same. So, you know, in one classification, there might only be like one or two swimmers in your nation, and they might be the top two swimmers in the world. So there isn't that same competition for places they know that if they do okay and train, they'll probably be in the top five at the Olympics without two. So it's it's very different. Whereas, you know, on the able-bodied side, it's so much more com- competitive from that. There's just more people, isn't there? There's more able-bodied swimmers. So from that side of things. So there's a lot of that. And then obviously the practicalities of, of working with somebody who's who's missing a limb or um, visually impaired and and actually doing cooking and going into their apartments and helping with that. That was something that, that really helped, helped my skills, things that we would just take for granted. You had to be really creative around with meal planning and practical food. James, just going back to your experience and and working with um, athletes with uh, type one diabetes, what would be the, the common concerns that from their end that they might come to you with? And I suppose, how would you, guide them and moving forward and and some of the experiences and that side of things with athletes yeah i mean what one of the things that i learned quite early on working in like a clinical setting is that most doctors and nurses that specialize in type 1 diabetes have next to no understanding about sport and exercise and next to no understanding about sport and exercise physiology so sometimes you would have this this athlete or sports person trying to explain the demands of their sport and then you've got a 
a diabetes nurse or a diabetes consultant who's trying to control their diabetes as if they were a 60-year-old sedentary person. And that was something that I managed to navigate. I I, I could actually understand the, the medical insulin management and long-term complications of diabetes, but also the exercise physiology and help both sides to understand uh, where they were coming from. But that's one of the big things that I see that an athlete will be, you know, being told, oh, this is too low, this is too high, you're doing this, and almost made to feel a little bit shame where, whereas they're just trying to manage their sport, <laughs> trying to keep the blood glucose levels stable, trying to have enough energy to do the sport, enjoy it whilst carrying this this kind of lifelong condition around with them um, and just showing showing some empathy and trying to actually work with the athlete rather than using their numbers as like good, bad, you know, or you've got, you've got, your blood sugars are too high here, they're too high here, whereas, well, why is that? And they're higher than what we would recommend. Maybe we can accept that for this period, that's actually okay because the risk of going hypoglycemic in these periods is is worse. So that's one of the big challenges. It's quite hard now that I'm out of the health service trying to, if I'm seeing a, 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 a client privately, trying to give them the things that they need to be asking for in their clinic because I can't really be, be sending letters to like a, a hospital because I'm not attached to a clinic anymore. Luckily, I still have some consultant friends that that specialize in this area that I can actually refer into. Um, but that's, that's one of the big things because with type 1 diabetes, I will say the nutrition should be the same as if you haven't got type 1 diabetes. The energy demands are still the same. Um, you know how much carbohydrate and protein they need to to do any sport is the same but what needs to be considered is how do we adjust the insulin to to allow for this and too often it's been been taught the opposite way around it's like no you, you need to eat all of these things to maintain your blood glucose levels but it's like well no that that's just wrong like we we if you don't have diabetes that's not how how your body works so it it, it needs to be thought of that way get the insulin regime right for the for what they need to eat and for the demands of the exercise then we can fine-tune the nutrition should it shouldn't be the other way around i think that's something that, that gets missed quite a lot and then you have a patient or a client who's just in the middle like they're just like oh i'm being told to eat all of this by a sports nutritionist who's right i'm also being told that my blood glucose should be this by the diabetes team which is also right but they're just like stuck in the middle unable to do the sport that they want to do um and I always think, you know, I have kids now, but I like to run and keep fit and keep active. If somebody now today said, okay, bang, you've got type one diabetes. I would still want to do all of those things. I would still want to, you know, go out for drinks with friends. I would still want to eat the foods that I want to. And it's, it's, it's putting yourself in, in that person's shoes and thinking, okay, how, how can I help them still do all of those things whilst managing this, this health condition? And do you have any insights into where you've seen that being managed really well? Like, is it behaviors that they, is it managing their timetable? Like what would you say is the key characteristics for someone who's, who can manage it and do all of those things? It's, it's really, really hard. Like, like I say, like now having kids, sometimes it's, it's a challenge just to brush your own teeth in the morning if the kids are acting up. And I think about somebody having type one diabetes, who's probably had to make, 20 decisions you know before you know mid-morning around what they need to eat checking the blood glucose how much insulin should they have how active they're going to be that day but i always the work i've done in this area it's, it's always trying to make the person be an expert in their own condition because i can't manage somebody's type 1 diabetes neither can a, a doctor or nurse in a clinic the, the person really has to be the expert in their own condition they need to know how they respond to different situations, how stress, uh, the menstrual cycle, travel, all of these things affect them and then they can adjust things themselves and empowering that that individual, that, that's the key to, in my mind, good good type 1 diabetes management. I think when it's done too much like a prescriptive, I'm the expert, do this and go away, it's just going to fail because there's so many touch points in a person with diabetes day where they where they need to, yeah make decisions so you need to empower them to make the best decisions they can and would that be down to james getting them to understand their like for carb counting and understanding how to do their insulin depending on what what their activity levels would be that day how much they're consuming is that kind of really more an education 
for them to really understand that and I suppose then the stress factors as well or what was kind of uh what was the most common thing that you would do for athletes with type 1 diabetes to manage their their blood sugars yeah absolutely I mean as nutritionists we will always come at it from a from a nutrition lens won't we so the big thing I would try and do is yeah is educate them on carbohydrate counting educate them on you know glycemic load and understanding how a big amount of carbohydrate might affect the blood glucose levels differently to a small amount of carbohydrate and then educating them on how to adjust their insulin on top of that so like layering it up um i was trained there's like a education program called daphne that we run in the uk i'm not sure if you, you run it in ireland as well dose adjustment for normal eating and it's a german model and you can tell it's german it's very like logical methodical steps but it it kind of it it does work it's it's very black and white and people then have a framework that they can count the carbohydrates adjust their insulin and then manage other life factors as well and i used to find that when we would teach these programs because you teach it to maybe 10 10 patients at a time you would have people from all different socioeconomic backgrounds and I remember we had one class and there was a, a guy, he was a university professor, super, super academic. And there was a, a mechanic, a car mechanic. And the car mechanic just picked up these these rules, right? Okay, yeah, bam, bam, bang. And he he really understood it and just grasped it and, and ran with it. Whereas this university professor wanted to hypothesize every scenario on this on this scheme. And he just never really got to grips with it because he was trying to overthink everything. Um, but that that was a yeah a good good structured education program that we, that we used to run um, that saw a lot of success and we had a lot of follow up with it as well. But it all centered around giving the person the tools then to you know manage their condition at home with this with this framework. Would you have worked with any um, client that was obviously doing long endurance sports or you know when you see that blood sugars can for some sports rise during or then obviously go into hypo what was kind of the how would you deal with that with it with the client yeah so two strands you'd be thinking like like we would now you presented with an athlete they're doing an endurance challenge what are the energy demands how do we fuel this that that's the first part we should be thinking of then the second part is how if you qualified then how would we adjust their insulin to allow this to happen with with minimal minimal disruption so some people would need quite a big reduction in their background insulin um for a challenge like that others might need to give small amounts of of fast acting insulin over the day to to allow for these spikes in blood glucose um others might need need none so again it's understanding the physiology understanding their nutrition demands and then understanding how we how we kind of join all those up so they they can get you know to the end of their challenge performing um one thing we used to see quite a lot was athletes would try and elevate their blood glucose really high because they were scared of hypoglycemia. But what I would see then would be quite big fluid shifts and issues with hydration and cramping because their their blood sugars are running really high. So that that's kind of not optimal. And then obviously running them too low, you're, you're running that risk of hypoglycemia. So it's just trying to find that sweet spot of, okay, I'm, I'm in a safe zone. My blood sugars aren't going to be too high that... I'm affecting my hydration and cramp. They're not too low that I'm I'm going to, you know, start losing concentration and then help them to to navigate that. And usually that would be somewhere around 7 to to 12 millimoles per litre. Um that was kind of what we would yeah look to keep keep people in, but again it's individual. James, can you draw that out a little bit more in terms of fluid and cramp? Uh, I hadn't heard about this before. Is this specific to people who've typed one diabetes or, or something more uh, general and endurance sports? No, it'd be somebody with type one diabetes. I mean, probably with type two, but just because their blood sugars are going like really high, you know, so if you think our blood glucose probably wouldn't go over nine, we're talking about like 19, 20, 21. So it's like a real like falsely elevated um, blood glucose and the body will try and correct a lot of this. It will, um, you'll try, you'll actually find that people pass urine more to try and get rid of some of this glucose by peeing it out. You can see quite big, big fluid shifts as well. So, when with those fluid shifts, it can affect like sodium balance. So, it's more in those kind of extreme outliers. It won't be something that 
yeah that that we would face it's a big thing with cramp it's something i see so often <laughs> and my my short and kind of sarcastic answer is if you're getting cramp you're not fit enough <laughs> because obviously there's there's caveats to that but we i always get riders in the in the spring where it's quite cold like less than 12 degrees first races of the season and they'll cramp after the race they'll be like oh i need more sodium i need this i need that i'm like well what what are you basing the fact you need more sodium on it's 12 degrees you're clearly not dehydrated how was the race oh the race was really hard i was in this attack and i was going for it and i was pushing pushing things it's like yeah you've you've just pushed your muscular muscular system further than what you've actually trained for it's just neuromuscular fatigue the nerves are just going you know they can't keep up with the the contraction you're trying to make your body do because we've just done the tour de france in 40 degrees no nobody got cramp we weren't doing anything crazy with electrolytes or things like we're just you know good good hydration protocols so it's always making the athlete think or maybe it's not because of sodium and hydration maybe it's just that it's just neuromuscular fatigue but yeah a bit of a sideline there's a lot of those kind of things i suppose with um um any athlete but particularly endurance athlete where they kind of are seeking that extra bit of information but maybe potentially don't have the basics or the foundations kind of laid is there do you have any insights i suppose because you've worked at such a high level within endurance sports as well the tour de france within that where you've been able to make minor adjustments that have had a profound effect on performance yeah i mean cycling's bad for it i mean most of my most of my work's been in in cycling but i've not grown up being being a cyclist but it's always looking for the silver bullet or the next supplement or the next thing to get an edge, which is, which is natural because like equipment is so important in cycling. It's a little bit like formula one, you know, equipment and aerodynamics is huge. So they're constantly pushing things on that side and with nutrition and physiology, they're always looking and which is fine. I think, you know, we use this phrase in our team that you have to be able to fly the plane but you also have to maintain the plane as well. You can't just kind of fly this this plane until it gets old. So you have to constantly look to innovate to keep up. But one thing that I, I see a lot is that people search innovation so much that they just miss the big fundamentals of glycogen, <laughs> carbohydrates, you know, are you op- optimizing all of those side of things? And and typically, you know, in my experience, that that gets like glossed over. So the team that I work with now, we were, we, were, we were the smallest team in the Tour de France and the youngest team, but we finished the tour with all eight riders. All eight riders were healthy. They all had stable weights. Um, we were still performing in the last few stages. And and we put that down to just doing the basic things really well consistently with nutrition. So we were kind of getting the riders to weigh what they were having, reporting into me. We were monitoring everything, you know, after the, really hard stages where they were completely empty. I had a protocol to get like five grams per kilogram of carbohydrate into them over the first four, four hours. Stuff that's it's out there, you know, that that's not groundbreaking science. But a lot of teams didn't pay the same attention to that from speaking with colleagues on on the race. Um, whereas it, part of my role was I was on the bus, I was weighing out Haribo, pasta, smoothies, individualizing it to, to the riders on the team. They were completely, you know, stars in the eyes. They were completely empty. If I'd have just left a scale and some food on the bus, I know that less than half of that would have been consumed. Then I'd see them at dinner. Then we had a plan for dinner based on their energy demands of that day and what they were going to do the next day. And just having a bit more detail and attention to make sure those steps were carried out, I think was probably one of the key factors that we finished with all eight riders fit and healthy. James, you mentioned uh, individualize there, and I'm so happy you did because there's an awful lot talked about individualized nutrition and the future of performance nutrition and nutrition in general. Personalized nutrition is is now being talked about. You're talking about eight riders. An individualized approach is important based on the standard recommendations that you're talking about. What does that mean? for eight different people, eight different personalities with likes, dislikes in, in practice? Yeah, it's challenging. I mean, eight eight is probably like the upper limit. And within our squad, we have climbers who might be 61 kilos. And then we have real big 
powerful time trial sprinters who were 85 to 90 kilos. So there's, you know, a 30 kilo difference just in, in body mass. But then on the back of that, there's stages where the lighter guys really need to perform and then the bigger guys just need to get through. But there's still an energy cost to, to getting through. You have to come through in the same, um, in the time cut. And then, yeah, riders will have different preferences. Some riders struggle to eat a lot of solid food after the race. So some riders, we, we would have like pasta or, or things that have been prepared by our chefs. Other riders would just want to have uh, Fanta and Haribo and smoothies in that first few hours, which as a, as a nutritionist, you might think, oh, you, you know, we shouldn't really be recommending that. But in those first few hours, you're just wanting to get the carbohydrate in and resynthesize glycogen, whatever it, whatever it takes. You obviously wouldn't want them to be eating and drinking food like that at home on the couch. So it's just getting an understanding of of those kind of things. Um, some riders were, you know, most of the riders were quite happy to weigh and measure and report into me, and I was there as well to to weigh and measure. But other riders didn't want that that level of stress and scrutiny, so I had to kind of almost give them a recommendation, but accept that they wouldn't give me the same level of detail back. Um, and give them a bit of trust in that. So, yeah, it is tricky. I guess it's a little bit different to team sports where you've got more people, but I guess the demands aren't probably as extreme. You know, the the, the length of the match is the same. You know, you might be substitutions and things like that, but it's all kind of a bit, a bit closer, whereas we might have one guy burning like 3,500 calories, one guy burning 7,200 calories, you know, in the same stage. So the sheer volume for those bigger guys is is a challenge we have a team sport athlete uh, on our on our team uh james and she talks quite a bit about the demands of her match <laughs> so there's a bit of debate here because um she was talking about the entire lead in to the match also being a part <laughs> i'm having a bit of a dig here at Gemma. she can address this herself but i i think in really practical terms it would like, what are the demands that we're talking about? What does it mean? Because we've been watching the tour on Netflix and even people who don't watch cycling know about this extreme level of fitness. But I suppose it's just for the general population that may be watching this. What does it actually mean? What What's the physical toll on the body for these riders? Yeah, I mean, the big, the big thing that this is the second sort of fans i've done the big thing you see is just the the emotional psychological you know fatigue because you're just around people all the time even for me you know you're sharing a room with somebody for i was away for 28 days so you're just around people all of the time you're on the bus with your eight teammates and a few staff sitting at the back you get off the bus there's press there you know interviewing you while you're warming up you go to the podium there's there's media interviewing you so it it's just and there's a lot of scrutiny and stress around around the race so you've got that as well that you have to take into account because that affects people people do strange things in those those situations with food choices with equipment choices you know so you have to really be sensitive to that and just try and get them to anchor back to the less stressful situations where we would follow the same same kind of things and you know in that last week riders just get fed up of eating even though we have a chef and a food truck and each day we're trying to give creative solutions and meals, they, they're just bored of eating. They just don't want to eat. So you really have to work with them as an individual. It's no good saying, eat this amount of pasta, follow this plan and you'll be grand. It's like, how, you know, how do we actually help this guy to, to get, get in what they need? Obviously the, the energy demands from a calorie perspective are, are quite high. And we're lucky enough. We have we have the power meter, we have the heart rate monitor, so we can we can quantify that. Whereas I guess in a lot of other sports, it's more difficult to um, to quantify. We also have crashes as well. You know, we had riders crash. It's part part and parcel of it. So then you've got to manage that. The psychological effects of crashing. People then knowing they're not going to be able to perform optimally, but there's no substitutions. You either crack on and struggle through a few days or you're out of the race and some riders might not get to do the Tour de France again. And one of our riders fell on the first stage and fractured his elbow. He had to ride the full race with a fractured elbow. He crashed three times in the race, so he was pretty miserable by the end. But he'd never done the Tour de France before, so now now he has. Um, one of my mates 
messaged me saying, oh, can you make a substitution? I was like, no, it, it doesn't work like that. You either you either do the race or you don't. Um, so it's a, it's a brutal sport. And then the weather, you know, we had 40 degree heat some days, rain, hail, crosswinds, mountains. It's But again, that's part of the reason I love working in the sport because it is so dynamic. Each day is a new a new puzzle, a new challenge. Um, and the other thing is weight is so important as well. So you could actually just pump in as much calories and carbohydrate as you can, but riders can actually gain weight and be heavier at the end of a grand tour, which can be a disaster. So it's, it's navigating all of that, getting them, keeping them happy, keeping them healthy, fueling for the demands of that day and the demands of the next day whilst keeping the weight stable. So it's a constant, constant uh, tightrope. Um, but professionally, it's, it's such a good challenge that yeah, I really enjoy. What would their fuel demands look like when they're actually out cycling? So what would what would be the type of things that they would consume? How often, how long would they be out for? And even across that amount of hours, what would be the total energy intake um, that they would be looking at? I suppose it's different for the weights, but what would be a, a general um, general intake? Yeah, um, so the stage is typically are around four and a half hours, but sometimes it can be be a bit longer. So on Sunday, we were up in Glasgow for the World Championships and that's an extreme race, but that was six and a half hours in length. But in a Grand Tour, it's between 150 and 220 kilometres. So it's, it's still a long, a long old, long old day out. And we we have like different different guidelines for different, different days so i do like an energy prediction uh depending on the elevation the distance how many calories i think they'll they'll get through that day and then we have kind of fueling recommendations based on that typically they would consume around 80 to 100 grams of carbohydrate an hour and we have i try not i don't like to be too prescriptive um on every stage with this because some riders might just have a preference for certain products that we have on that day mm-hmm. Um, so if it's if it's cold they will naturally consume less carbohydrate from from liquids because they're drinking less if it's like a flatter stage with less intensity they might want more solid food so we have you know sports bars small cakes um because when you're on the bike for a long time you can't just live off gels and gels and drinks every day you get quite bored of that then when we have like real intensive or key stages i do like a small um sticker for each rider and it goes on like the 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 stem of the bike and it's like broken down hour by hour so you know what they need to eat each each hour um with some flexibility in there but just as a bit of a, a guide and a structure because again we think of this stuff because we're nutritionists that's our job but i always think a bike rider's job is to try and win bike races so i always try and think how how can i make what what i know and think they should do easy so they can see it action it and then then move on because they're in a race you know there's 200 other guys in this race they're going down mountain passes you don't want them to be thinking oh well i've just had a bar and my next so you need to make things quite easily so they they know okay every every 15 minutes i need to have a gel or if i get through these in this hour then that's my fueling done done for the hour um so it's quite a simple it looks almost like a kid's done it but it's they they know they can just look down okay tick tick and then they're in the race on extreme days, we might push it to like 100, 120 grams of carbs per hour. But again, that's that's quite rare. And I'd say most days are between 80 and 100 grams of carbs an hour, which sounds a lot. And if you think on a bike, on a long day, that could be five grams per kilo of carbs just from what they've consumed on the bike. Um, so it's, yeah, when you're thinking about that full day. So on the biggest day in the Tour de France, and I tweeted a little bit about this just because I found it interesting, I think we saw like intakes between 18 and 22 grams per kilogram of carbs. So it's a, it's a lot, but and it's probably more than what you'd see in a textbook, but it that's, that's what they had. And I've had people, low carb people challenging me and all kinds of people commenting and messaging me on it, which I found really funny. I was just showing what, what they were eating. It's not, it's not groundbreaking. They were doing a lot of work and they had a lot of carbohydrate quite straightforward. If you ask me, James, this is, absolutely phenomenal like the information the insights i i've been either nodding or shaking my head uh, for the best part of it of an hour because it's 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 just intriguing 
Um, I uh, I I have to touch on on one quick thing because uh, we we work with um triathletes, uh, we work with marathon runners. We don't run, or sorry, we don't run. We don't work with uh, cyclists at the level that you're working with. But uh, I have um, got a lot of questions around ketones, and I've even participated in research around ketones. Just a, a couple of sentences uh, from your perspective, <laughs> just a couple, just to hear it from somebody who works at your level in inside. I mean, I I could even chop it down to a couple of words. Save your money. <laughs> But um, yeah, for me, like you know, keto ketones are used. Um, not not in our team. We have a, a a stance and a policy. I've had to write a policy of what they are, what the potential mechanisms are, what the evidence says, and why we don't use them. From a from a performance perspective, I don't think there's a, there's sufficient evidence to use them as a as a substrate. Um, especially when most people aren't optimizing carbohydrate intakes. We've got like hundred, you know, over a hundred years of carbohydrate research, and people are still getting it wrong. Yet they want to start using ketones. I, I just can't get my head around it. Um, so from a as a substrate, so something to use like before or during things at the level i'm working at you know if you want to go fast for a long time then then carbohydrates should be your currency if if you're doing you know ultra ultra endurance and not at the elite level then like yeah i, I don't know but I, I don't work with those kind of athletes if you want to win races and, and go fast then you need carbohydrates if you know there is some research around them being used to help with overtraining and recovery and there may be something there in the future but the 35 euros a shot you know could could that money be spent better even you know in a professional setting where we have a budget and if i went to our team and i said look i really think we should invest in that they would probably give me the budget for it but i just don't think there's there's justification for it um I think the yeah. research more points towards impeding performance than it does improving performance. Um, so that's that's something to bear in mind. Uh, we're going to go for uh, we're conscious of your time. Two questions. Uh, I I have one question that I want to ask. Unless uh, some of the team have some other burning uh, questions, I'm going to go back to Gemma and then um, we will we will wrap it up. It's been a phenomenal hour. The only other question that I did have was um because it, you referenced it at the very start about people coming to you for advice. Um, there was so much advice in this and I suppose insights more than anything, but if uh, for a young practitioner coming out into this world, like what so was advice would you from whether it's frame of thought or approach to how they navigate this industry, what would you suggest? Good question. Um, I got asked about this recently and I like had a bit of a think about it. Like you really, really like have to love it if if you want to work at the like with elite athletes, because if you're working with elite athletes who are at the top of their game, they expect everybody around them to be at the top of their game. So if they ask me something, or uh, I need to know. I like I I need to be as elite as they are as a performer. I think I need to be that level. As a nutritionist, I, you know, that's that's how I come at come at it. You know, am I on top of new things that are coming out? Am I kind of speaking to other experts? Am I am I always like one step ahead? You know, it's like the, you know, if like a piano teacher needs to always be one step ahead of ahead of the pupil, else else they'll got get caught up. And I think it's easy to say, oh, I want to be a sports nutritionist. I want to work with with the top athletes. But are you? yeah are you doing all of those things are you kind of live, living and breathing it and you know it's it's hard to to do all of that and you know have a family life and a social life but it's it's really important that if you want to work with people who are at the top of the game then really you need to be at the top of your game with cpd and all, all of those other things and pushing things forwards and i think if you're not doing those things then there's there's a bit of a disconnect and it's either well maybe you you're not cut out to work in that arena or maybe you need to address those gaps to 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 help you progress it um and then just being just being curious and speaking with people and you know re reaching out to people um i think being being proactive like we 
with my team, we've had um, students through Liverpool John Moores as like a master's placement because I'm quite passionate about supporting practitioners coming through because a lot of people help me. And, you know, we've had students who've been like brilliant, like people who, are, who as soon as a job comes up, I would appoint them. People who it's almost like you, you, you're pulling teeth. You, it's like you're you're trying to like G them up and get get something from them. I'm like, you've got this opportunity. I'm I'm giving you athletes to work with. Where's where's the enthusiasm? Like, where's your where's your drive? And I think you know that having that and having that spark and being motivated and driven. Like I know there's there's much more academic people and you know cleverer people than me but i know that i have that kind of work ethic and drive and being good with people that i think will always set set you apart somebody who's got a few grades better than than you in an exam no i just said that's an incredible answer yeah that's the best answer i've ever heard given to that question james <laughs> i i uh Gemma does the edit on this um Gemma, can you please clip that up? Uh, the world needs to hear that, James. That was that was unbelievable. We have a philosophy, uh, James, within what we do that everybody can be a high performer. And leading on from that, the idea of live like an athlete has, has evolved. And it means something very specific to us as a team. For, for anybody listening, what does it mean from your perspective to live like an athlete? I mean, as I think this morning, the like chaotic start to the day that I've had with the kids and the chaos that's going down downstairs, I would I wouldn't say that's that's uh, optimal. But you know, athletes have to have to deal with all that stuff as well as uh, normal people, like us. I think the the best athletes are selfish. Would be probably a word I would use, which is probably always sometimes you viewed as like not a positive attribute to have but in selfish selfish i mean that they're they're focused and dedicated to 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 what they're trying to achieve not you know selfish that they you know buying new clothes for themselves and seeing the family go without so they're selfish in terms of what they're trying to achieve and really focused on that and i think that's probably something that that would resonate with yeah trying to live like an athlete whatever it is that you're working towards kind of going after it and 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 being like a dog with a bone and making sure that you, you that you get it that resonates uh james this has been a, an unbelievable start to our day and uh an incredible uh we, we we i have a couple of people who i work with and their word is rich there's so much in it for people who are interested in in high performance for people who uh, may be interested in working in performance nutrition and anybody who wants to feel inspired, uh, it's um, it's inspired me this morning. My energy is up because of it. And that's <laughs> about you um, and the way that you speak and the way you communicate and the way that you've given those insights. So uh, a massive, massive, massive thank you for your time this morning. I think others will, will fully appreciate it as well. So thank you. Thank you. That's very kind. And yeah, it's something I feel passionate about. So I was happy to uh, to to chat about it. I think we're a better profession when we when we talk and help each other out rather than um, you know, being in one camp or another or, you know, this football team or that football team. I think the more conversations like this we have, you know, I've I've learned a lot from from you guys as well this morning and from the work that, that you do is the the Davy Nutrition Group. So yeah, thanks. <laughs>